I'd like to now move on to extending our notion of strain to a pointwise notion in the full multidimensional case. So, so far what we have is a definition of strain that says that it is defined in terms of the derivatives of the motion. So for in the 1D case we have epsilon is equal to du dx where u is the displacement in the x direction and this is what we call normal strain in, in what we're going to develop. So now as a first step let's first get a corresponding concept to shear stress and that's going to be something known as shear strain and this is actually defined through what is known as relative angle changes. So, so the strain that we had in 1D this epsilon du dx is that's changes in relative length and in a multi-dimensional case we have to worry about changes in relative angle and the way the definition of shear strain works is you consider a square of a material let's say in the xy plane and we consider a motion that changes angles so we think about this little square being sheared over and that there's an angle change here of an amount gamma so it's the decrease in the right angle of this little xy 90 degree angle so we have a cube it's aligned with or square aligned with x and the y axes and the decrease in that angle due to the deformation we're going to call the shear strain and the symbol we'll use for shear strain is gamma now sometimes what we'll do is we'll be a little bit more specific especially when we work in the 3d case we'll say gamma xy so we know that we're talking about shear strain or changes of angle in the xy plane or that change of the angle between the x and the y axes so that's our definition. So we have normal strain, say on this square, that's delta L over L. So we stretch the device in, in a given, or object in a given direction. We compute the change of length and divide it by its original length. That gives us normal strain. And then if you have shear, we have this change in angle, the relative change of the 90 degree angle, and we'll call that gamma, and that's gonna be our shear strain. So that's the setup for shear strain. And now we are in a position to kind of go full out and look at how we get pointwise strain in a multidimensional setting. So in the general case, we have a body, and at every point in the body there's a displacement. And that displacement can have three components to the displacement. There can be a displacement in the x direction, which we'll call u. It can be a function of x, y, and z. There is a displacement possible in the y direction, we'll call that v. And there can be a displacement in the z direction, we'll call that w. And u, v, and w can all be functions of x, y, and z. So this is starting to look quite a bit more complicated than what we had before, but if we approach it systematically, we can develop useful relationships that have uh, the right meanings. So let's start, and we'll kind of simplify things. We'll get rid of the z axis, so we won't worry about the z dependency, and we won't worry about w. We'll just do this in two dimensions. And let's first look at it determining an expression for normal strain in the x direction. So let me go ahead and focus in on a point whose coordinates are x, y, and I'm going to look at a line segment of material. Uh, and so the other end of this line segment is going to be x plus delta x, y. So it's in the same vertical uh, elevation as the first point, but it's just shifted over in the x direction by amount delta x. And let's look at the relative change in length of this segment of material. So on the right side and the left side there's going to be a motion at the left side the motion will be u evaluated at the point x y and the motion on the right side will be u evaluated at x plus delta x comma y so that gives me my two displacements in the x direction and now I can talk about the relative change in length in the x direction by simply differencing those displacements and then dividing by the original length of the segment and then we'll do the standard procedure of taking the limit as the length of the length segment goes to zero that way we get a definition at a point and what we see now is we get something quite similar to what we had before we get the derivative of u with respect to x but now it's a partial derivative because u depends on multiple variables x and y in this case and we're going to call that the normal strain in the x direction and the notation will be either epsilon x or epsilon xx so the, you'll see both notations and the double scripted notation is meant to parallel the double scripted notation that we had for stresses. If we want we can do the same thing in the y direction we can look at a segment of material that extends in the y direction from xy so that the bottom of the segment will be at xy and the top of the segment will be at x comma y plus delta y so the length of segments delta y and 
there's vertical motion, y direction motion at both of these points. And so I can talk about the relative change of length in the y direction. And so that will be the difference in the two vertical displacements divided by the length of the segment. And then we can take the limit as delta y goes to zero and we'll get an expression for normal strain in the y direction. So epsilon yy, or epsilon y if you want, is equal to the partial derivative of v with respect to y. And if it's a 3D problem, you could do a similar construction with a, a bit of material extending in the z direction, and you'd find that the normal strain in the z direction is equal to the partial derivative of w with respect to z. So it's not too much different than the 1D case. We have the derivatives of the deflections with respect to their corresponding coordinates. Now, there is one technicality that I do want to mention here. Uh, the derivation was a tad bit sloppy uh, in, in the following sense. So if I want to know the relative change in length of a, le a segment of material that extends in the x direction, so I can, it starts with uh, coordinates x, y, and x plus delta x, y. But after deformation of the general 2D body, uh, the two points don't have to line up in the same vertical plane. So there can be vertical motion or y direction motion on the point on the left. And there can also be y uh, direction deflection at the point on the right. And so now if I want to talk about the relative length and change of this line segment, it's a little bit more complicated. I have to take the difference in the new delta x with the original one and divide by the original delta x and then take the limit. That would give us a proper definition of normal strain in the x direction. So if you look at the geometry here, you can write this out using the Pythagorean theorem as the form shown over here. It's a little bit more complicated here. Uh, and I can take the limit as delta x goes to zero. So I can divide through the delta x in that radical and kind of simplify this a little bit. And if I go through that exercise, I find that I get the square root of 1 plus 2, the derivative of u with respect to x, plus the square of the derivative of u with respect to x, plus the square of the derivative of v with respect to x minus 1. So this is quite a bit more complicated than I had before. And to recover the expression that I derived on the, on the previous slide, what I can do is consider only the case where the gradients are small. So any derivative of u, v, or w being a small quantity will allow a great simplification here. Because if the derivatives are small, when I square them, they get really, really small. And if I'm adding them to themselves, then I can actually ignore these terms that have squares on them. So I can drop these two terms here that are the squares of the derivatives. And then considering again that the, I'm assuming the gradients are small, I have the square root of 1 plus a small quantity here. And so square root of 1 plus a small quantity is equal to 1 plus 1 half times that quantity, as long as x or the quantity here is going to be small. So that's just the first two terms of the Taylor series. So if I under the assumption of small gradients, I can have the expression that the normal strain is equal to the partial derivative of u with respect to x again. So, And we're going to use this assumption throughout what we're going to do in this course. So this is known as the small strain or the infinitesimal strain assumptions. And that, that then makes those normal strain expressions that we had on the previous page correct. So you can do the analysis a little bit more fully, but you arrive at the same result under the small strain assumption. So this we now have our expressions for pointwise strain in the x, y, and z directions. Let's go ahead and look at shear strain. So to look at shear strain, what I can do is I can look at an arbitrary body and go to a point, and then I can draw a line segment in the x and the y direction. I'll call that delta x and delta y, those distances. And I can look at this 90 degree angle and look at how it changes. And that will give me an expression, pointwise expression, for gamma x, y. And then I can do this in all in the two other planes, in the y, z, and the z, x plane. So if I look at the, the, the after picture, so after I deform it, my three points are going to move. And now I'm going to be interested in this interior angle between these two line segments now. So let me go ahead and define the exterior angles, beta 1 and beta 2. So those are the angles from the x and the y axis to the line segments now. And the shear strain itself, the gamma xy, is going to be the sum of these two angles. So it's going to be beta 1 plus beta 2. 
So let me go ahead and redraw this. So if I redraw my two line segments here, let me go ahead and define some distances, A, B, C, and D. So those are the rise and run of the line segments. And now I can go ahead and write down expressions for A, B, C, and D relative to the displacements of the three points that I have. So the corner point and the two end points. So, and in particular then, uh, beta 1 is equal to C or D over C, and beta 2 is equal to B over A. And so there's, there's a small motion assumption here, uh, which is similar to the one that we made on, on the previous slide. So let's look at beta 1, for instance. So the distance D is the difference in the vertical motions of the corner point and the end point off to, to the right side. And then C is the horizontal uh, length here between these two points. So C is going to be delta x, the original length, plus the difference in the displacements of the two endpoints. And if I take the limit as delta x and delta y go to zero this expression, what I'm going to find is that beta 1 is the derivative of v with respect to x divided by 1 plus the derivative of u with respect to x. So what I've done here actually is I've divided through the top and bottom by delta x and then taken the limit. Now, as long as I'm assuming small gradients, 1 plus the derivative of u with respect to x is just equal to 1. So my final expression for beta 1 then becomes the derivative of the vertical motion, v, with respect to x, the horizontal coordinate. I can do the same thing for beta 2. I'll find that it's the partial derivative of u with respect to y. And if I put everything back together and apply my general relationship over here, I find that the shear strain in the xy plane is partial derivative of u with respect to y plus the partial derivative of v with respect to x. So it's a little bit more complicated than the normal strain expressions, but uh, relatively the same thing. You're just taking first derivatives of the deflections with the coordinates. And in this case, you have two deflections to account for, the, the two deflections in the plane you're considering, and you're taking the derivatives with the opposite coordinates, so u with y and v with x. If you want, you can go through the same construction in the yz plane and the zx plane, and you come to very similar expressions here. So the partial derivative of v with respect to z plus the partial derivative of w with respect to y gives us the shear strain in the yz plane, and then similarly for the zx plane. So not too different. Um, real briefly, uh, that was the Cartesian case. We can also talk about polar coordinates and we can talk about polar strains. So for instance, we could talk about something like epsilon RR, and that would be the normal strain in the radial direction. And the way we determine that is through a construction quite similar to what we did before. We would consider a line segment of material that's in the radial direction. And so we have sort of a, a before picture, and then maybe after deformation we have an after picture, and then we can talk about the relative change of length of this line segment. And if you go through the exercise, the geometry, it's a little bit more complicated, but you can show that the radial strain is equal to the derivative of the radial motion, so ur, with respect to the radial coordinate r. So it looks quite a bit like what we had for the uh, normal strains in the x, y, and z coordinates. Uh, we could also talk about the normal strain in the tangential or hoop direction, so epsilon theta theta. And what we do is we draw a arc of material from one point to another. So this is an arc of constant radius. Okay, And then we'd look at its before length and we'd look at its after length, take the difference and divide by the original length. And if you again look at the geometry of this and go through the exercise, this is quite a bit more complicated than the Cartesian case, you find that the hoop strain, epsilon theta theta, is ur over r, so the radial motion divided by the radius of the arc, plus the derivative of the motion in the tangential direction, u theta, with respect to the theta coordinate, all divided by the radius. So it's, it's a fair bit more complicated than the Cartesian case, but uh, there are expressions that connect the deflections to the strains, even in the polar case. What's really important, though, here is to understand the physical meaning of what it means to say epsilon rr. That means relative change of length of a segment of material oriented in the radial direction, and epsilon theta theta is relative change of length of material oriented in the theta direction, so it's kind of a, on, a con, on, a, on a line that has constant radius, so it's really a curve. Uh, and then 
the shear strain in this context would be a change of angle between the radial coordinate direction and the tangential coordinate direction. So, so if I look at a point in the body and it has a ur and a u theta, so those are displacements in the radial and theta directions, uh, then the shear strain would correspond to the change in that right angle between those two coordinate directions.